I feel like something's <laughs> missing though. I feel like yeah. I think did you, you we're we're live, we're live streamed, we're on YouTube. You got a microphone? Yeah, I got a microphone. But uh, you know what I think two co hosts equals one host, so we're fine. Okay, yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> This is the Two Age Sojourner podcast, and uh, Mike is not with us. He normally hosts it, but Mike has uh, got a bit of man flu. We can say anything we want. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Although the last time I did something like this with Chris, I ended up getting like a backlash of episodes critiquing. That's because it's because I was so unhappy. I'm here. I'm with you. <laughs> That's <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> um, Anything else I need to cover? Oh, I'm, I'm Andre. I'm pastor of Bethesda <laughs> Baptist Church, Felix Stowe. And that's Nick. And he is pastor of? Pastor of Covenant Grace Baptist Church, Timaru, New Zealand. There we go. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's all we need to say. And we're going through baptism. We're talking about baptism and we're... Yeah. We're... So we're looking at uh, Fesco's books, uh, Word, Water and Spirit. And uh, we are, we've been looking at the Reformation. And we've now got to Zwingli, the Anabaptists, and the Schlethan Confession. That's our goal, to cover that. And that's what we're wanting to dig into today. Mm. Now, you mentioned earlier on that you had done a dissertation on Zwingli. What was that all about? My, just my degree dissertation, not anything heavy. But yeah, it was just on... I can't even remember. It was so long. It was like my UNISA. And I've done a lot of, a lot of things since then. So I can't actually remember exactly what the, what the deal was with Zwingli and what the focus was. But all I remember was that it was on Zwingli. I think it was to do with... I think it might have been the sacraments, actually. But <laughs> I can't really remember. <laughs> all, all I remember about it is, um, is uh, having to buy ridiculously expensive books. Or, you know, because I was in South Africa at the time and getting, getting like um, uh, primary source material on the reformers was not cheap, you know. Yeah, for so sure. So a couple of the books down there, great voices of the Reformation and that kind of thing that I had to buy to get like, you know, Zwingli in his own words. Nah, it was so expensive. Yeah. But that's cool. it. All right. So, well, let's, let's dig straight in. And um so we want to start off with Zwingli and uh, we want to look at his uh, definition of a sacrament. Mm -hmm. And this is how he defines it. Now, as we come to Zwingli and the Anabaptists, the, way, the reason why Fesco puts them together is basically because a lot of the Anabaptists were under Zwingli's ministry for a while. And it seems that some of Zwingli's key definitions shape their definition. So uh, where you've got Lutherans, the Catholics, and even some of the reformers on the one hand, you've got a, 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 a different school of thought with Zwingli and the Anabaptists. So quite, quite distinguished. So here's his definition of a sacrament. A sacrament is a sign of a sacred thing. So good so far. Mm -hmm. That is of grace that has been given. Mm -hmm. Note the past tense there. Mm -hmm. I believe that it is a visible figure or form of invisible grace, which has been provided and given by God's bounty. That is a visible example, which presents an analogy to something done by the spirit. Now there's a lot of uh, Baptistic type language. And what I mean by Baptistic is that, that which we're very familiar with in, in the 21st century. And uh, Zwingli is, is sort of seen as the father of the memorial view. And he's very clear on outward of the inward, mm -hmm. a visible sign of an inward grace uh, where we would talk more about a means of grace. He's, he's yeah. he definitely, uh, goes far from that sort of definition. Do you think it's worth just drawing out some of the, the distinctions between what he's saying here and what we've seen so far? So like, what would be the difference between Zwingli and, and Luther, for example? So uh, for, for Luther, so it's, I guess, if you look at the question, you know, is there a blessing to be had in baptism? Is there a blessing to be had in the Lord's Supper? Are there blessings to be had in the sacrament? For Zwingli, the answer is a clear, the, the signs do not confer grace. Mm -hmm. Whereas for Luther, the signs definitely confer grace. Mm -hmm. So that would be the sharp distinction. Yeah. And then the difference between Luther and uh, the, the Catholicism before him is... 
Are you happy to give a little recap? Not to put you on the well, spot. Well, I've just got to, I've got to reshuffle the deck in my mind. So, yeah. okay. well, it's basically, so, what I mean, is it, is it that they're both saying Luther, you know, like the, like the, uh, the medieval theologians, you know, before him and the, the, the early church theologians before him are saying that there is a kind of grace that is given in baptism, conferred in baptism, but for Luther, it's connected to the word and to the promise. So baptism is like a promise or a preached Definitely. word. Um, so because Luther stressed the necessity of faith mm. and faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the word had to be the dominant element. So the mm. spirit working through the word, the objective promise of God being given, the spirit enabling faith in a monogistic act. Um, yeah. And that was more concretized by later Lutheranism. Yeah. Um, Yes, whereas, so it was more uh, like it was more like yeah, there is baptismal regeneration, but it was more like hearing the word with faith kind of thing. Except yeah, it gets so the spirit fuzzy. gives the faith while the preaching of the gospel is going on through the visible sermon of baptism. Yeah. Whereas for the Roman Catholic Church, it's more about you know the priest who's been properly ordained, being the conduit of the grace of God mm. as he's properly under the, the Pope who's had apostolic succession and mm -hmm. you know the the the, the ecclesiological means. Yeah. as opposed to the word and spirit working together. Yeah. And so um, basically, you know, since Sertullian, we haven't really heard any voices saying no infant baptism um, until Zwingli, you get a flicker of it. You get a flicker yeah. of it. So Zwingli flirted with the notion. Yeah. So uh, just coming back to his uh, definition of sacraments, um, he then goes on to talk about uh, baptism. And here are his distinct uh, sort of ingredients as he talks about baptism. Firstly, he calls baptism a public testimony. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a theme that's going to carry on through the Anabaptists, and it's probably one of the dominant ways in which modern evangelicalism would define it. Mm -hmm. So in this way, Zwingli is very influential. He writes this. Um, it's a public testimony as when, we are as when we are baptized, the body is washed with the purest element. But by this, it is signified that by grace of divine goodness, we have been drawn into the assembly of the church and God's people, wherein we ought to live pure and guiltless. And so Swingley departs from the Catholic view by not speaking of grace working by the instrumentality of the water. Rather, the action is an analogy or an illustration of what the spirit does. So that would be one of the distinctions you were asking about earlier. Mm. And so for Zwingli, grace and the sacrament are not intertwined. Yeah. Uh, he writes this. I believe, yea, I know that all the sacraments are so far from conferring grace that they do not even convey or distribute it. So he's, this is almost a reactionary position by Zwingli to What do you think he's getting at there by, by saying, like, do not even convey or distribute it? Because to me, like, I didn't really understand what that means. Is, is he getting at something specific there? Or is he just trying to say, look, it doesn't do anything? Well, uh, uh, Fesco does touch on it. So let me, let me read a, a few more lines. And then what Fesco does is he, he, he highlights that Zwingli has a, a Neoplatonic mm -hmm. sort of understanding of things. Right. Okay. And so, so let me get to that shortly because mm -hmm. that definitely answers uh, the problem. So Zwingli writes this. I've, uh, I've already read that part. Okay. So, he, so rejecting ex opera operato, he says mm -hmm. this. A channel or vehicle is not necessary to the spirit. Mm -hmm. for he himself is the virtue and energy whereby all things are born and has no need of being born. So, I, I mean, you're probably familiar with Michael Horton and he's, he's been very helpful in popularizing the reform view. And, uh, you know, as he dumbs it down, he, he, he talks it, he talks about the fact that, you know, mediated grace versus unmediated grace, mm -hmm. you know, the charismatics and the cath and, um, the charismatics and the Zwinglians are all about unmediated grace, yeah. whereas yeah. the reformed have this distinctive of mediated grace, the means of grace. Yeah. Um, and, and to some extent, Catholicism too, you know, there is a... God, exactly. God so works Catholicism, by means. Catholicism uh, yeah, they, they definitely have it. It's just they have a more ex opera operato approach. Yes, yeah. So there's, there's a... Yeah, but there, the, the, kind of, the, the kind of idea, because it sounds right, you know, you, you read something like that and you say, well, look, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't need, you know, anything like it. It's not a channel or a vehicle is not necessary to the Spirit. Well, you know, obviously, yeah, of course, the, yeah. That, is, that is true. No one's going to disagree with that. But, you know, Christians have always kind of said, 
Um, and, and I guess that's my point with, you know, even from Roman Catholicism, everybody has said that there is this kind of means that God has chosen to use. So he's, you know, that's his choice, his prerogative as to why God does things the way he does them. You know, that's, that's not really our, our business, but, um, but everyone has recognized. So Zwingli is challenging a well-established notion here that, that's yep. going to get undone by. Definitely. By yeah. So this is why he's distinguished from the Lutherans, Catholics, the reformers. Mm -hmm. He's got a, he's got an alternative way. Exactly. So the memorialist view um, really traces back to Zwingli. So that's the one aspect is very much the outward of the inward. Mm -hmm. But then here's mm -hmm. the sort of second distinctive as he talks about baptism. Zwingli emphasized the oath or the public testimony or the pledge nature mm -hmm. of the sacraments. Okay. Whereas Luther saw, uh, the sacraments as God's promise to us, not our pledge to him. So when he was all about, this is your word to God, not God's word to you. Um, so do you think he would have stated it as strongly as that? Did he keep anything about God's promise? Um, it's not reflected in Fesco. I think what Fesco does is he sort of shows how Zwingli was yeah. sort of the father of the overemphasis that you find in the Anabaptists. Mm. So this particular distinctive as it was, uh, articulated in reaction to what the reformers were saying mm -hmm. led to the extreme of what the Anabaptists finally came up with. Yeah. But so, I mean, that's right though, in a sense, there is a, there is a sense in which again, is is what he's saying isn't untrue. It's just more the emphasis. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, as you listen to, when I listen to Luther, although I disagree with his, you know, very concrete view of how, you know, the, the Holy Spirit's using the sacrament and the word and the spirit are working in the, in the particular way he describes. I'm very sympathetic to the language. And I've, I've got a lot of sympathies with Zing, Zwingli in the same way, mm. because I also want to avoid the, uh, the sacrum sacerdotalism yeah. of yeah. The, the Roman Catholic church. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what Fesco does is he, he looks at uh, Zwingli's very unique view on the sacrament and um, his view is derived in part from the Latin meaning of the word sacramentum, which was an oath of allegiance that was taken by a soldier before a general. Hmm. So there's this cultural practice that's predominant at the time of Zwingli, which he's using. So instead of working with the original languages and going back yeah. to the Greek and so on, yeah. <laughs> he's anachronizing. Yeah. And so uh, like a soldier uh, uh, under a flag or a banner, you know, sewing a flag or a banner on his clothing and identification, uh, identification with the army that he fights with. Uh, that's what baptism is. It's a pledge to follow orders. You're swearing your allegiance. And uh, so it's all about you, your commitment, your promises. It's yeah. man's word to God and not God's word to man. And a lot of Baptists are saying, amen. You know, <laughs> I think, well, I mean, I th here's, 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 here, I've got, a, I've always have a bone to pick with Lutheranism and Catholicism because, you know, when we talk about baptism, it is God's word to man. Yeah. Primarily it is God's word to man. It is all about his promise. It's a, it's a promise that speaks of something past, something present, something future, something that God is doing to you. Mm. You, you're the receiver, not the doer. But then, so that's the objective perspective on baptism. But then there is also a mm. secondary subjective element, which is our response, our commitment, our calling upon the name of the Lord, yeah. our expression of repentance, our identifying with Christ uh, and the visible church. Mm. And so, uh, and as everybody soon as you have, recognizes this. Everybody well, does. They do, but pragmatically, how do they emphasize it in their theology? The Lutherans actually are pure monogists. They would say that as soon as you talk about subjective element, you, you're becoming semi-Pelagian. Right. As monogism is the, is, is the lens they're looking through. But, and, but uh, they will also pick and choose who they baptize. So like apart from infants, they are selective about who they baptize. So, so they are acknowledging implicitly that there is a subjective element to baptism that must be there. There is a kind yeah. of, there is, there is a faith or a response or a repentance. Well, if you, well, exactly. They, they have to bring the faith in. It was one of Luther's distinctives. Yeah. So, I mean, you might want to call them uh, inconsistent on that point. <laughs> I, I think I do. I think officially I would like to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, just carrying on with um, Zwingli's definition of baptism. So Zwingli thinks that the, uh, the word baptism um, has four meanings. So firstly, it means immersion as a pledge. It refers to the inward enlightenment, calling and receiving of the spirit as promised in Acts 1. 
It refers to the external teaching of salvation and immersion in John's baptism. And fourthly, it is a metonymy, that is one thing for another. External baptism stands for, in the stead of, internal faith. And so he writes this, Christ himself did not connect salvation with baptism. It is always by faith alone. So, you know, there's some really healthy emphasis there that we'd mm -hmm. be very happy with. Mm -hmm. But he, he's also strongly dividing things that scripture is a lot more comfortable putting together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I get a little nervous when people start saying, well, Christ himself, because what they, you know, if they're not careful, that kind of thing can sound a little bit like you got the Gospels versus the epistles, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. yeah. So he goes on, uh, material water cannot cleanse the immaterial soul. And so once again, this shows uh, what others have pointed out that's a sort of an incipient Gnosticism in Zwingli. Mm -hmm. That there's the spirit flesh division that not, you know never the two shall meet. So it's just a, a very uh, polarized way of thinking in, in Zwingli's thought. But the one thing that he said, and this is what I do like, is uh, he stressed how the mode of baptism, the going under and the coming out of the water, illustrates dying and resurrecting with Christ. Yeah. And once again, as a Baptist, I feel like I'm in familiar territory uh, with Zwingli again. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, of all the options so far, um, there's a lot there. There's a lot with Zwingli that we'll be comfortable with. There's some that we're uncomfortable with, but that's more or less the kind of the same as Luther. So, you know, there's a lot that we're comfortable with that we affirm say, amen. There's also some stuff that we're uncomfortable with and say, no, that's a bit too far. And I feel like, you know, reading them both, um, you're, you're begging for some sort of middle ground, which I guess we're going to get to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Zwingli early in his career expressed a hesitance on infant baptisms. So now we're coming to the infant baptism part. Mm -hmm. And Zwingli had a unique view early on. He thought that the early church first catechized infants and then baptized them. So if you're going to, if you're going to baptize an infant, you first have to give them some Sunday school first. So this, this would be a delayed infant baptism on Zwingli's part. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. Baptists, we're going, amen. We don't mind baptizing people who are young if they know what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Um, but then in 1524, his view became more concrete and he wrote his first defense for infant baptism. Now, he mentions in that, in that work that he, he was nearly deceived and, and, and uh, abandoning the right. But in his, in his defense, he shows that he retains it for different reasons to the Lutherans and the Catholics. So he's pro-infant baptism, but not on the same grounds as others are. Mm -hmm. And so here are some of the things that he, he, he emphasizes. So Zwingli saw that both circumcision and baptism were both signs of the covenant. Mm -hmm. And he was probably a lot stronger on that than, than, than a lot of the others. And that just as Abraham was not justified by circumcision, nor does baptism justify the Christian. He admitted that God brings people into the covenant, uh, the covenant but still predominantly emphasized the oath pledge angle. So I think this would what we would might want to call a contradiction. He allowed people to be brought into the visible church and yet continued to stress baptism as a pledge and an oath. We would see those two things working against each other. Mm -hmm. And then based on this parody, both are rites of initiation and baptism definitely does. Just explain that quick, Nick, because the, 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 some people might, might not be tracking that. So explain what you mean. Like, why would that be, why would that be something that we'd see as inconsistent? Well, if, if he says that infants can be added to the visible church mm -hmm. through baptism mm -hmm. and yet baptism is prime predominantly an oath pledge thing. Yeah. How are the infants making the oath pledge? They can't therefore yeah. given the nature of what baptism is that the, those particular subjects of baptism, the infants should by definition be excluded. Yeah. So, so similar to the problem of Luther saying baptism is a preached word that should be received by faith. But, <laughs> but there's no understanding. <laughs> so it's like it's difficult to understand how that can happen. Yeah. And so shouldn't you just wait? So at the moment, not baptizing infants solves all the Protestant problems. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so he, he argued against the Anabaptists that the order in the Great Commission is to first baptize and then teach as a way of defending uh, infant baptism. He believed that both baptism and circumcision looked at the same thing, God's salvation in his son. So there's a lot of good theology underlying it as he, as he looks at the unity of the Old and New Testament. Um, 
So despite this unified view of the Bible, Zwingli was not united with the Catholics and the Lutherans who saw the, weed, uh, the water as a means of grace. He, mm -hmm. he writes, the Holy Spirit was not given in that act any more than in baptism. So <laughs> there are these emphatic statements by Zwingli about the Holy Spirit not being given in baptism. So then the question arises, well, then what could the benefit to the child be? And uh, he says, well, without faith, two things are still operative. The promise of God antecedent to the right. So the objective promise of God mm -hmm. and uh, the faith of the parents. So those two things are still active. And exactly how a promise without faith works and how a faith of another person is yeah. is beneficial in any way. Well, I, I, personally, I personally feel like Zwingli would have definitely been a Baptist had he not been under so much pressure to oppose the Anabaptists. So, yeah. you know, again, I think that, I think you could probably say that um, for most of the magisterial reformers, there was a huge amount of pressure not to buddy up to the Anabaptists because they were sort of struggling for survival themselves. And the Anabaptists- Well, the fabric were, of society was based on, you know, you're yeah. born into a church, you're part of a nation, yeah. the, the national church system, you couldn't That's tear right. that apart. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. So the, you know, it, it had the mag it, it was a wise tactical decision, you know, by by most of the magisterial reformers not to give in on this point because then the magis yeah you know, the Reformation might have been might have been stopped before it started. Um, it was that it was that big a deal, you know. And I think yeah. the, I, I think that Zwingli, you see it more than with Luther. I think Luther probably would never would not have gone. Baptist anyway, but he might have been more sympathetic had the circumstances been different. But Zwingli, I, I, I mean, I, I, he could well have been a Baptist. You know, he could well have gone down the Baptist route. Yeah. If, if you know what I think the uh, you know what I think the reformed retort was be. Well, you can have him. <laughs> yeah, you can have him. <laughs> yeah, he's not the, he's not the better of the reformers. He's got all sorts of Gnostic elements in his yeah. theology. The only reason he was nearly Baptist is because of his bad theology, not yeah. because of his good theology. But so, yeah, I mean, and, and I get that. But uh, you know, <laughs> although I think, I think it's a, it's a slippery slope going down that road. I think there's lots of mud that could be flung everywhere. But the um, the the I think what you know, and obviously this is speculation. But things might have been different had more, yeah, had guys like Swingley, say, for example, followed his convictions uh, and gone down the Baptist road. He might have then had successors who would surpass him in their theology. Um, yeah. You know, you might have had kind of, you know, what Melanchthon was to Luther or, um, you know, little protégés who come along and, and try and, create some middle ground between some of the other or, or, or soften some of the hard edges of your position because of conversations with Calvinism and Lutheranism and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's pure speculation, but had it gone down differently, um, you know, we might've, we might've seen better Baptist theology sooner. Yeah, no, for sure. All right. So that's Zwingli. And um, again, some great stuff going on, but then, just these little idiosyncrasies, which really tripped him up. What did and you think about, what did you think just yeah. quickly about um, the argument that he makes, uh, you know, about the order, you know, baptizing and, but, then, and then teaching? Like, how much do we, how much do we put on, on that argument? So, <clears throat> do you know what I'm talking I guess, about? The, the way yeah, says, I guess the, uh, uh, I guess the Greek could be ambiguous. <laughs> You know, go and fulfill the great commissions, make disciples. And then as you make disciples, there are two things you've got to do, baptize and teach. And whether there's a, a deliberate order being stated there, um, I think you wouldn't make the argument on that verse alone. You'd have to look at how the apostles practiced it in the book of Acts, how Christ uh, and the, the, the disciples practiced it in their kingdom preaching throughout the gospels. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it doesn't really bother me either way. No, yeah. I, I think the Greek is, because is it, I, I, I'm trying to go from memory here, I haven't got it in front of me, but is it that you've <laughs> basically got make disciples as the main verb, and then you've got three participles around it, which is... I think four, going, yeah, something like that. Going, yeah. uh, teaching, 
baptizing. And so you can't, normally there's a word order for emphasis, but the word order in Greek, you can't, you can't go to the stake on, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's a, you know, I, I get, I think if there's a Baptist way yep. of, of no, applying that, that order, it's saying that they don't have to have a full orbed, you know, systematic theology in place before you baptism, baptize them, you know, but surely they must know the gospel. I think that's not, yep. not, not you know, otherwise what is it? <laughs> right. <clears throat> cool. The Anabaptists. Yay. So uh, Anabaptist obviously means rebaptizer, and uh, no doubt a slur. It would not have been a name they would have chosen for themselves. But uh, my feeling is that it's a slur that's derived from the Donatist controversy, um, where you know the rebaptizer was the bad guy because you know oh, if someone yeah. had been baptized in the name of the Trinity, then their baptism was legit. They didn't need to be rebaptized just because the priest had uh, you know forsaken the faith. Mm. So. You know, historically, this 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 name, this label, carries bad connotations, and uh, and we would we would always respond and say, well, we're not baptizing you again because you've never been baptized publicly. Mm. You know? right. Yeah, yeah. So the um, yeah, it's a slur because it has that kind of connotation. Because somebody, a modern reader, might think, well, how is that? How is that a negative thing? Like, yeah, I'll rebaptize. <laughs> Yeah, but it's, it's, it's it the connotations. Yeah. yeah, and technically in Acts nineteen, there is uh, some of the disciples of John the Baptist were baptized the second time, so that That's we true. see at least yeah. at least in that example uh, when people have a dysfunction, some some dysfunction in their baptism. Yeah, there is a legitimate place to rebaptize, and yeah. we we don't know all the details. It's a summarized narrative. Calvin tried to say that um, that they hadn't. Um, how did he do? He, he moved away from water baptism and said he baptized him in the spirit. Anyway, he, he, he tried his level best to get around the fact that a second water baptism was going on there. And um, personally, I just feel that was dishonest. Yeah. But, uh, well, the Catholic Church did something similar recently where they had to re-baptize a Catholic priest because his first baptism... <laughs> They'd used the wrong formula. You or, told me. Yeah. I might have to get rebaptized. I'm Greg. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. So the, the, um, the, the, the whole rebaptizing thing, like everybody does recognize again, this is one of those things where it's fun to, it's fun to check it at Baptist, but everybody recognizes that there is a time and a place to when, when you have to declare the first baptism null and void and this, yeah. it has to be done properly. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So uh, what Fesco does is he gives us a couple of the big guns from the Anabaptist stable. And uh, first up is Conrad Gribble. And uh, so Conrad Gribble rejected the idea that one can be born into the church. Amen. <laughs> now, Peter Baptist uh, brethren would be disagreeing with us. But uh, for us, that's a, that's a key thing. You cannot yeah. be born into the church. No. You got to be reborn. So, <laughs> adoption <laughs> into Christ, <laughs> baptism by the Spirit into the church. But mm -hmm. the, they, they, of course, use the distinction of the visible versus the invisible. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, he goes on to some, some well, of his other distinctions. Isn't it more like, because we also use that distinction. So isn't it more the whole fact that it's the kind of external, internal covenant community thing that I think. Is well, you're not, no one is born into the visible church for a Baptist. No, no, that's true. You, that you, is true. You're added by baptism into the visible church. So, so we, we, we actually both see baptism playing the same function, that by baptism you're added to the visible church, but it's not by virtue of birth that you have the right to be added to the visible church. Quite right. So, yeah. All right, so Conrad Grebel, uh, for him, baptism was a sign of submitting to Christ's rule. So this is a man's word to God emphasis very much, uh, and willingness to be subject to church discipline. So you are... You know, you, you're buying into something. You're making this grand commitment. The so how does that work for a, young, for you, for young Christians? So if, the, if the, let's say you baptize a 10-year-old because they clearly had a credible profession of faith. Well, uh, you know, if, if, if we believe that a young person can confess faith and it's appropriate that their faith uh, be shown as biblically in baptism, um, we don't believe that the church replaces parental authority. No. So while, while that child is still a child and under their parents' authority, mm. we, we're not going to overtake the, the role of the father and apply church discipline when it's a matter of parental discipline. Yeah. But, um, 
Yeah, that's so right. If that's anything, you, you work with the parents to help them to. Yeah, and even when it comes to, we've, we've allowed teenagers to come into members of the church. And just as where they're not old enough to vote yeah, for the, exactly. the government of the land, we don't allow them to vote in key issues. We encourage them to participate in appropriate discussions at the business meetings, but you know, kids have bedtimes and that sort of thing. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah those yeah. things, th those are just ways of, of taking the realities into account. But um, so the church is a voluntary association of believers as opposed to a God created, we create the, the, these are all the, the sort of the man centered elements you should be hearing in the definitions that Fesco is helping us to see. Mm -hmm. It's a voluntary association of believers who committed to live in obedience to the gospel. So baptism is all about that. And uh, when you get baptized, you, you agree to be subject to the ban. That's uh, the shunning process of church discipline. Now, what's interesting is I was chatting to uh, someone from Gloria Vale, which is uh, an Anabaptist sect on the West Coast in New Zealand over the weekend. And uh, he was relaying the story of because uh, they all have to make a commitment to basically part of the commitment is, you know, we, we commit ourselves to submitting ourselves to the elders of this church and we'll do whatever they say, recognizing that they are God's voice in our lives, basically. And uh, he, uh, he left and then he went back and he bumped into the leader of the group. Hopeful Christian was his uh, rebranded name. And um, Hopeful said, well, what about your promise to the church? You know, you made this commitment. You promised yourself to the church. And so his mindset, it's very Anabaptist. You know, it's, you've promised yourself to the church. And now to leave the church is to leave Christ. Mm. And so it's just their baptism, their view of the, uh, this particular group's view of visible and invisible is all, is all wacko. Excuse the pun. And uh, <laughs> yeah, just uh, joining the group, submitting complex, yourself to discipline. It? Yeah, very much so. So, um, I mean, so just, just, I think it'd be helpful given that we've raised it, like what is the difference between shunning the way say a cult or perhaps an Anabaptist would um, and the kind of excommunication that we would do? Like, what's so, the key so I think the, 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 the key difference is firstly, Thessalonians mm -hmm. talks about, um, you know, the person who's not willing to eat, I mean, not willing to work in order to eat. Mm -hmm. There's a form of discipline there that doesn't involve excommunication that you yeah. still affirm your love to him as a brother. So there's a, there's, there's, you know, for most people it's black and white in or out. Whereas Thessalonians gives us a clear example of a middle road. Yeah. yeah. Whereas still Anabaptist gathering around theology, the table, but yeah. Anabaptist theology doesn't have, you know, you don't call that person a brother. And then the second one is uh, one Corinthians five, where, you know, do not even eat with such a one. Yeah. Where we understand that the early church practice would have the love feast either at the beginning or the end of a communal meal. So the communion and communal eating were one and the same. Yeah. So yeah. We, we would understand that to be talking particularly about the Lord's Supper. And that's what's being guarded. Mm -hmm. So we would allow them to come to church. We would allow them to participate in Bible studies, you know, unless they're child molesters or, yeah, you know, yeah. people who've got some sort of criminal element, which would endanger folk in the church. We wouldn't be encouraging them to sit under the preaching of the gospel because mm -hmm. the gospel is the means by which they would repent. Yeah. But uh, the Anabaptists don't have that. They, they, it's almost as if, you know, the old parenting technique, you know, your child's not obeying you. Hit harder, shout louder, that will change them. It's, a, it's, it's very much depending upon the severity of the treatment yeah. to try and yeah. shame them and to, to get them to come back. And to my mind, that's, that's trusting in law, not grace. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, thanks. That's very really helpful. So it's not because uh, I've, you know, we've all watched those documentaries about, you know, that, that Baptist church in the States or whatever, and the way that it shuns people that leaves its community and they don't, no one's allowed to talk to them. We had a guy here who nearly became part of our church from um, Jehovah's Witness. He, he came across, heard the gospel here, was convinced that this portrayal of, um, of the gospel was true and that this interpretation of the scriptures was right. He was utterly convinced by it, but he said, they will not let me see my family again. And that was too much for him. And he just, he couldn't, he couldn't bear the cost and he went back yeah. and it was the saddest thing I mean, I've ever seen. That interpretation is a convenient tool for control, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that's just, a key thing in cults, isn't it? Is the control factor. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, that's, def 
Great. Thanks. Back, back, back to other Anabaptists. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Grebel rejected all the patristic formulations saying that they dishonored Christ and the faith. And he said this, infant baptism is a senseless, blasphemous abomination, contrary to all scripture, contrary even to the papacy. Now, it's a radical statement, which is, I think, just rhetoric and not informed. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why it's put there. Yeah. How is infant baptism contrary to the papacy? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> so he writes this. The scripture describes for us thus that it signifies that by faith in the blood of Christ, sins have been washed away for him who is baptized, changes his mind, and believes before and after. That it signifies that a man is dead and ought to be dead to sin and walks in the newness of life and spirit, and that he shall certainly be saved if, according to this meaning, by inner baptism, he lives his faith. Now, what you need to look out for in that particular definition is there's some good stuff, mm -hmm. but there are some worrying things where he will certainly be saved if according to this meaning by inner baptism, he lives his faith. So mm. lives his faith where you turn the Christian life into your faith. And you turn faith into a work. So this is, this is a trend that you find in Anabaptist theology. Well, you find because it today. All, yeah. So because it's all about my commitment to God and baptism is just another way in which I show my faith and my commitment. Mm. This is the reason why Anabaptist theology around baptism is actually very bad, semi-Pelagian. Mm. But here's, here's, here's my pushback to this, um, this critique. Believer's baptism is also perfectly in line with sola fide. <laughs> you know, it's not only semi-Pelagians who believe in believer's baptism. You can hold to sola fide, you know, and by grace alone, Christ alone, and all the solas, exactly. and uh, believe in believer's baptism. Yeah. You're not a semi-Pelagian just because some semi-Pelagians held this particular view. No, it's not a it's not a, a necessary development of semi-Pelagianism. Neither yeah. is it necessary that by believing in, um, you know, baptism upon credible confession, that you have to have a semi-Pelagian system yeah. to get you there. Yeah, I think that's so really important. Stress when we stress that there is a subjective element to baptism, that there is a word from me to God, it's a responsive word. Yeah. It, it's, you know, I look at Acts 21, where Paul is telling the story of how Ananias came and baptized him. And Ananias said to Paul, Paul, be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So there's this, there's this definite verbal thing that goes on on the part of the person being baptized where it's me responding to God, me calling upon on Christ, me declaring him to be my Lord, that word Lord being the key there in terms of my submission, my obedience, my handing over my life to Christ and my turning my back on sin, faith and repentance are all wrapped up in that. Mm. And um, I think we do need to, to stress that the subjective element is there, but it's responsive and it's secondary. The primary word in baptism is God's word to us, but there is a responsive word. And we're not saying synergism. We're not saying synergism in terms of soteriology, but we are saying, you know, just as my faith is a response. Yeah. Um, well, it's like, it's like the, the whole concept of effectual calling. You know, if, if the, the fact that the calling becomes effectual, doesn't in any way require semi-Pelagian faith. That's, you know, it's standard textbook yeah, reform theology. Good point. You, yeah. you have to have effectual calling. And there's a, you know, we recognize that that's a reality. And baptism is simply saying that the callings become effectual in this one. It's not just that he heard the gospel. You know, it's that it's become effective. You know, it's, there's been a change. There's been an, an efficacious um, a display yeah. of the Spirit's power. And the effect is my faith, my repentance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Amen. All right, Hans Denk. Denk was originally part of the Lutheran part of the Reformation and then moved over to the Anabaptists. And in 1525, he wrote about baptism, saying, it cannot externally wash away sin. The baptism of the Spirit by Christ, not water by men, cleanse, is what cleanses the heart. By faith, a person enters into covenant with God, and the Spirit of Christ descends like a dove, Here's the problem. And ignites the fire of love, consumes what infirmity remains and completes the work of Christ. So mm -hmm. that sounds like the language of perfectionism to me right it does, there. Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> There's also the, uh, the not so subtle implication, like the work of Christ is not finished. Um, and I guess you could take that to mean, you know, in the same way that Paul talks about, you know, making up 
what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. You could, you could take it in that sense, but you could also very much so. And I get the feeling, <laughs> <laughs> I get the feeling. It's something it's, else going on. There's something yeah. else going on. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, so he, he believed that uh, whether faith in Christ was accompanied by water baptism or not, uh, baptism was not determinative of salvation. So you didn't need to be baptized to be saved. So it's one of his, and, and, and we would all agree with that. Yeah. So it appears, though, that Denk's inner versus outer baptism structure to his thinking affected his view of the scriptures. So he was a, a very, almost a Bartian sort of approach. The Bible was useless apart from the inner working of the spirit. Um, so again, it's sort of a Gnostic dislocation. Um, so that, that just an overemphasis, mm -hmm. which seemed to impact various parts of his uh, theologizing. Um, and then once again, Denk te tended to move beyond faith to love as the Christian life, lacking the usual reformation emphasis of faith alone. So turning faith into godly obedience. Mm -hmm. So once again, the semi-Pelagian emphasis. It just goes to show, doesn't it, that when you're in a situation, because you can kind of understand why they did it, you know, if, if you read anything about the state of the church, you know, during this time, you recognize that, like, you understand why people became monks and hermits. Like, it, it, if you wanted, like, an authentic display of, of the Christian life, it was quite difficult to find, but, uh, you know, by all accounts from that, that period. But the, the, and so the tendency then would be to address that, by addressing the lifestyle straight away, you know, and you kind of get with, with these guys that they're trying to do that. They're trying to get to that authentic Christian life. But by doing that, they're so eager to get there. They're almost too quick to skip over the gospel on the way there, rather than yeah. seeing that it's through the gospel and through emphasizing the gospel that that authentic Christian life is, is, is you know, grows and matures. And so, but that's, I think, a lesson for us today, because I think we do, we do do this all the time. You know, whenever you're in this, find pastors, even in reform pastors, in, you know, in areas where there's a lot of Christian complacency, the tendency is to get out the stick and to start talking about moralism and behavior, um, rather than to keep trusting the gospel to produce that organic change. Yeah. I mean, if, if works is at the heart of your uh, theology, it'll impact everything. And then, uh, so Denk as well, because of this emphasis on obedience, he attacked predestination mm -hmm. because that would make you lazy. He attacked original <laughs> sin because then that you wouldn't be able to be holy. Yeah. Um, he attacked the reformed emphasis on preaching and the sacraments because it's what we do, not what God does. Um, because all of these things can lead to apathy and holy living. So inner spirituality was the thing that he treasured above the external right. And so that, that innerness and not the outwardness, the, <clears throat> the visible aspect be, uh, he emphasized. Isn't it scary, though, how much of these arguments are still in circulation today? Oh, totally. I think it's so <laughs> scary. It's like, it's like Anabaptism never went away. Like these, these kind of radical views. Like it's just basically I mean, this is just, this is just It's just self-dressed up in religion. That's all Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism. Uh, even Arminianism, that's what we would say it is. Mm. Yeah. All right. Balthazar Hubmeyer. Now, uh, Hubmeyer wanted a speedier reform than Zwingli, where Zwingli was moving slowly. He wanted something fast. So he left Zwingli and went out on his own. He began preaching and influencing people to delay their children's baptism for later uh, for, for a type of dedication service. Um, he was influenced by another Anabaptist preacher who convinced him and others to be baptized again. Mm -hmm. And this was done, how? In a public fountain with pouring. So no immersion yet. Um, and this is the, the re-baptismal practice. So at this, you, what, you, what you get a sense of here is the fact that they don't believe that people are born into the church. They believe that, you know, a person needs to be baptized. But yeah, they're still working it forward. They haven't, they haven't concretized their ideas yet. Um, Habmaya believed in three baptisms. There's the baptism of the spirit, which is the inner baptism. There's the baptism of blood, which is the uh, daily mortification of sin. And then the outward water baptism. And uh, this he believed, water baptism, he believed to be an outer testimony to the spirit's baptism. That it is an act by which one confesses their sins before all people. I must, you know, like a sinner's prayer, basically. Mm -hmm. And that one believes in the forgiveness of sins through the work of Christ. Water baptism is the outward enrollment and incorporation into the church. 
Amen. We happily agree with that. It is also a vow to abide by God's word, depending upon his strength and submitting to the ordinance of church discipline, according to Matthew 18, if necessary. And we would agree with that. I mean, d- depending on where you want to go with it, we think that that's good. Baptism is the entrance ordinance. The Lord's Supper is the fellowship ordinance and church mm-hmm. discipline is the exit ordinance. Um, so baptism, which, which speaks of inclusion, implies exclusion. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. He said, it is not a means of grace, nor is it regenerative, but is merely an outward w- uh, witness of an inner working. Hmm. All right. What is missing, of course, is God's promise to the baptized. In mm-hmm. all of these definitions, what we're not seeing is the, the Holy Spirit as a promise or the Holy Spirit as the seal of the promises of the covenant of grace, where God is pledging something to us that if we believe these are the things that are ours. So, um, yeah, it's an over, it's an overreaction, isn't it? I mean, <clears throat> it was, it was seeing two sides of the pendulum in some sense, you know, yeah. We're just begging from, for all that passive to, from all passive to all active. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're just begging for that kind of middle ground, you know, that, that yeah. level of perfection that we hold today. Exactly. The reformed <laughs> Baptist position. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, given this definition, you know, commitment, uh, infants should not be baptized. Mm. He emphasized that faith should precede baptism, which we believe is the biblical model. Now, he was a strong voluntarist who wrote on freedom of the will. This is where his semi-Pelagianism comes through. Right. Uh, in his book, he expresses a tripartite view where body and soul are affected by sin, but the spirit is sinless and upright. So I actually encountered this view recently in a, in a discussion with someone and they wanted to say, well, because man is tripartite, not bipartite, there's a part of us that's not affected by sin with which we can, you know, we don't, we, we aren't totally depraved and we can believe the gospel when offered to us. So there's a few things like that. It's and, uh, interesting perfect- how, because if you say, if you say to someone, Oh, well, the, the kind of, you know, do you have the kind of, um, you know, the twofold view of the human person where it's body and soul or the threefold, you know, where it's body, soul and spirit. And you think at the face of it, that sounds like it's just a speculative bit of philosophy that isn't interesting <laughs> at all, but it's amazing yeah. how much false teaching comes in through that window. Like it's amazing. Well, remember- Christians can be demon possessed in their yeah. spirits, but not their soul or their souls, yeah. not their spirit. The Holy exactly. spirit lives in the spirit part, but the demons live in the soul part Yeah. or uh, perfectionism. You know, when you get born again, your spirits become perfect. And now it's just the soul and the body that need to be changed. Yeah, right? exactly. It's, it's weird, isn't it? Like you think, it, and I think it, it, it's heresy, heresy and false teaching often do this. They exploit sort of little slightly, slightly strange um, definitions like that. Oh, yeah. You know, that you kind of, at first glance, in and of themselves, you think, well, that's a fairly unimportant division you know like i'm not sure i'm willing to 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 invest a huge amount of time in that but it's amazing how it gets exploited like you just alter from it's a back it becomes a back that little distinction becomes a back door for all sorts of rubbish it's crazy isn't it yeah crazy yeah here's another one you know praying in the spirit and praying with the mind yeah as if if words coming out of your mouth aren't impacted by the mind as if there's like a spirit thing going on without the mind no no it's it's just anyway yeah yeah so uh Hub Meyer had a semi-Pelagian view on the effects of sin, mm-hmm. seeing the spirit is free. And when the unfallen spirit chooses to take the medicine of the gospel, then his soul becomes regenerate and justified. He advocated rebaptism on the basis of Matthew 28, but he didn't have Greek. So, um, yeah, he didn't really wrestle with it very deeply enough. Mm-hmm. His view of the Old Testament was minimal, and he rejected the parity between baptism and circumcision. So these are just some examples of the Anabaptists who are outside of the mainline reform stream, who are quite semi-Pelagian in their articulation, Mm -hmm. who formulate baptism as God's uh, man's word to God, not God's word to man. And uh, here's my difficulty, though, is that a lot of people would say, well, because of the semi-Pelagian tendencies and they believed in believers' baptism, therefore anyone who believes in believers' baptism is, yeah. Yeah, and that's, I guess, something we're going to have to live with in the but you know in the same sense that um you know w- anyone who holds to pedo baptism is going to have to guard against a kind of sacerdotalism yeah ex opera <clears throat> operato yeah because from from our side of the baptismal pool 
everyone on the other side believes to some extent in ex opera, operato, unless they carefully articulate that they don't. Yeah, yeah. And then it, it's uh, like, in, and one guy, um, one guy I heard recently talking about battles and said, that, you know, it only becomes weird if you believe in the ex opera operato, the, the kind of magical view of the water where the, you know, it's a kind of magic act where you go in, you go out and you're actually changed. But it doesn't actually make any difference uh, to the kid. That's why it's okay to baptize them. But at that point, I'm wondering, <laughs> like, okay, it means that there's nothing, there's no travesty, I guess. But at the same time, like, why are you doing it? Like, if it doesn't, yeah. if you've just confessed that it does nothing. And it, the kid's not experiencing anything, uh, not, even, not even emotionally, you know. Yeah. Um, then All you're doing is confusing the definition of the visible church. <clears throat> yeah, so I think any time we get, we get lumped together with the Anabaptist side, which will happen, and we will have to guard against overemphasizing the subjective, you know, yeah. from our point of view. They will have to uh, guard against over, overemphasizing the sacerdotal nature of it, because if they don't go down that road, they're forced to basically say there's no point in doing it. Yeah. Which is no, not a very indeed. inspiring way to go forward. Right. How much time do we have left? Uh, we don't have a huge amount of time. Should we park the, the, the confession for next time? Can we? No, can well, we? we can. We, yep. Whatever. We'll speak to Mike, see what he wants to do. Yeah. Because I think we could, we could probably tag it in as a, by way of a, a recap in the next one. But we'll see how it goes. Cool. cool. I think we'll, 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 we'll pause it there. But anyway, thanks, Nick. That was great. Yeah, all good. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And thanks, Mike, for, uh, for not being here. <laughs> You've got so much more done when Mike's not around. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs>